and doing some page turning. So please bear with me. I hope you're ready to turn uh, because it's good for us to see the word so that you don't think it's just coming out of somewhere. It's coming straight from the word. So turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. And today I'll be re referencing scriptures from the King James, also the New King James, and the Amplified Version, because I like how the wording is expressed. And once again, that's 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, just to start off. And please note, in these passages of scriptures, the Apostle John is teaching his disciples what he was taught from the Lord Jesus. And so 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, out of the King James, and it reads, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So if we look at verse 12, once again, Simply put, it is saying, and why did Cain kill Abel? Because Cain's works were evil and his brothers righteous. Now look at verse 13. It says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Now I want you to let that sink in just for a second before I go any further. It says, marvel not. In other words, don't be surprised, my brethren, if... The world hates you. Now, please turn with me to St. John chapter 15, and we'll read verses 18 and 19. And that's out of the King James. Once again, that's St. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Thank you, Lord. And it reads, and this is Jesus. Now, this is the Lord Jesus teaching the disciples. If the world hate you, ye know, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, if you were of the world, the world will love his own. Yes, the world will love its own. But because ye, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, yeah. therefore the world hateth you. All right. Now, this was crucial to know for the disciples, because being that they were chosen out of the world, they still had to interact and deal and witness with those from the world. This mm -hmm. is still important to us today, because as disciples of the Lord Jesus, we have the same charge to witness, to interact and deal with those of the world that we may lead them back to the Lord. Now turn with me to our main text and all those scriptures that was read. Oh, that was phenomenal because now we're going to start unpacking them. So let's go to Luke, the gospel of Luke chapter six. And our main, our key verses for today is 27 and 28. So the gospel of Luke chapter six, verse 27 and 28 out of the King James version. Now this is Luke giving an account on what the Lord Jesus taught his disciples Luke is giving his point of view what he heard. In verse 27, it reads, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. Saints, today we live in a time where people are so quick to say, I hate you. I hate him. I hate her. I hate them. Not only do they say it, they will show it. We live in an environment where many are spiteful, bitter, malicious, mean, hostile, resentful, envious, holding on to grudges, filled with jealousy, and are unforgiven. We are in a deep of that time where Isaiah the prophet prophesied. Let's look at Isaiah chapter five, verse 20. Isaiah chapter five, verse 20 out of the King James. And it reads, woe 
And now, whoa, we can look at as judgment is coming or what judgment awaits unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Simply put, everything that God is saying is wrong, the world is saying is right. And everything that God is saying is right, the world is saying is wrong. Saints, we are in the last days where retaliation mm -hmm. is being praised and rooted for. Whether mm -hmm. you are listening to worldly music, turn on the movies or the TV, mm -hmm. people are avenging mm -hmm. themselves and boasting about it. I know mm -hmm. because even before I was saved, I was doing mm -hmm. this very thing and I was unaware of it because yeah. I wasn't educated on the word of God. How yeah. about you? Even when I started trying to walk with God, I thought I could still participate and do the same activities until God had to open my eyes and a change had to come about. Thank Why? you, Jesus. Uh -huh. And even our time right now, we have uh -huh. brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus becoming enemies amongst themselves because of some type of material thing or whatever it could be that caused the division. Uh -huh. Closest of family, relatives and friends have become enemies with one another because they failed to reconcile the relationship. Think it not strange that God gave us the ministry of reconciliation to reconcile to bring back individuals back in relationship with him. But yet we live in a society that tells you do to them what they did to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Get even, get uh -huh. revenge. Uh -huh. They deserve it. That's what society uh -huh. is trying to tell us. Uh -huh. Get even, get revenge. They deserve it. But mm -hmm. The Lord Jesus even commanded his disciples as it was read earlier in the context on John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. The Lord Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have loved one to another. Now, when the Lord Jesus commanded that, that was to the disciples to love one another, which is still for all who are in Christ, how we should treat and how we should uh, love on one another, how we, and especially in the family of faith. However, Jesus also took it a step further, in which we will discuss today. And it will challenge and help our spiritual growth. Not only does the Lord want us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, he also taught, and here you can write this mess, this title down. You've heard it plenty of times today, but love your enemies. Love your enemies. And the subtopic, stand in the gap for them. Amen. Stand in the gap for them. Love yes. their enemies and stand in the gap for them. And we're going to figure out, we're going to unpack the scriptures today to see how we can do this. Because without the Holy Ghost and without being submissive to the Holy Ghost, it's, it's impossible. Out of this flesh, in this flesh dwelleth no good thing. Can't do it in the flesh. I wouldn't even try it. Now, section one. You can write down love. Even when they hate you, God still wants us to love even when they hate you. Hate now, now, in that same chapter of mm -hmm. Luke 6, let us drop down to verse 22 and 23 out of the King James. Now we're going to Luke 6, verse 22 and 23. In verse 22, it reads out of the King James. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and they shall separate you from their company and reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. I'm going to read that one more time. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company. And shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil 
for the son of man's sake. So now let's unpack some important words. That word blessed in the context, in the Greek, it means to be happy, fortunate to be envied, well off in a position of receiving God's favor. Now the word hate in the Greek, it means to hate, to pursue with hatred, and to be hated. And that word reproach in the Greek, in this context, it means to criticize in an abusive or angrily manner, insulting. And one may say, well, why do I keep referring to the Greek? Well, when we're studying the word, the New Testament is written in Greek. So we want to go to the origin of, of the Greek for that word to get what it specifically means per context that we're reading. Because we'll see in here how that word blessed is used Two different times, it's used the same time, but it has two different meanings just in this context. And so now what we'll do is we'll, and also the Old Testament was written in, in Hebrew. So when we're reading through the Old Testament and we're doing a, a word search, we'll go look up the Hebrew word to get what it actually means. Because if we just stayed in the English, then we may, we will miss what the Lord Jesus taught at that time before we can apply it to our lives today. But now that we've got the meaning of the words, let's apply them back into the scriptures to see and broaden our understanding. And so I'll read it again, the scriptures like this. Blessed to be happy, fortunate to be envied, well off in a position of receiving God's favor are you. When men shall hate, shall pursue you with hatred or hate you, when they shall exclude you from their company, and shall criticize you in an abusive or angrily manner, insulting you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. I'm going to say it again. Blessed to be happy, fortunate to be envied, well off in a position of receiving God's favor are you when men shall hate you. And when they shall exclude you from their company and shall criticize you in an abusive or angrily manner, insulting you and casting your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Matthews 5, 11 out of the Amplified. And you already have these scriptures written, written down, but I want you to just see the viewpoint on, on how Matthew wrote it down. It says, blessed are you. When people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you for your association with the Lord Jesus. Saints, what the Lord wants us to know is how blessed we really are compared to what the world says they are blessed. Can we see the difference now through the eyes of God compared to the eyes of the world? In the world, blessings is usually equated to material things. Supposedly, the more material things that you have is the closer your relationship is with God. But that's incorrect. Now, don't get me wrong. God does bless his children with tangible things. The scripture says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But God blesses us when we need them and, and, and it won't detour us from the faith. Once again, we're going to get personal with this. Your personal savior, Jesus Christ is saying, when men shall hate you and when they shall exclude you from their company and shall criticize you in an abusive or angrily manner, insulting you and cast out your name as evil for the Lord Jesus sake, he said, we are blessed, happy to be happy, fortunate to be envied, well off in a position of receiving God's favor. If that is happening to you because of your relationship with your God. Now look at verse 23 and Luke 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 23. The Lord Jesus told his disciples, rejoice ye. In that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. 
Matthews 5, 12, New King James Version puts it this way. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, just to recap, and you'll see why I'm reiterating this so many times, because it's going to give us the strength that we need to persevere, to learn how to love our enemies when it comes at us that way. But now to recap, the Lord Jesus is saying, I should rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I should rejoice and be exceedingly glad when people insult me and persecute me and falsely say all kinds of evil things against me because of my relationship with the Lord Jesus. He said, when this is happening to me, I am well off in a position of receiving God's favor. I am blessed because my reward is great in heaven, which is far better than any material thing we can receive down here on earth. Remember, the Lord Jesus told his disciples, which includes us today, everyone that is born again of the water and of the spirit. He said, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, look, the Lord Jesus went through it first. There's countless times in the Bible where the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders, they tried to find an accusation against him. They tried to say he was breaking the law on the Sabbath because he did good and healed a man. The religious leaders tried to equate healing a man on the Sabbath as working on the Sabbath, which working on the Sabbath was forbidden according to the Old Testament law. So in that same chapter of Luke, scroll up with me to verse seven. Here's just one account on the false accusations they wanted to try to bring against Jesus. And verse seven reads out of Luke chapter six, King James. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. Saints, you got to understand that folks is going to be watching you. You may not even know that they don't like you. Just understand somebody's watching you at all times, whether they're looking to be inspired or whether they're looking to try to bring an accusation against you because of your relationship with the Lord. And look it. And because Jesus did good on the Sabbath, remember we read how Cain, what he did to Abel, because Cain's works were evil and Abel's was righteous. When you're doing good, you just understand that somebody not going to like it. And, and now just because Jesus healed on the Sabbath, drop down to verse 11. Verse 11, still out of Luke 6. And it says, and they were filled. Who were filled? with madness, the scribes and Pharisees, they were filled with madness and communed. They conversed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Don't be, think it not strange that somebody may be communing or conversing with an, somebody about what they might do to you because you are standing for the Lord. Now look at the gospel of Mark. He puts it in this perspective. Mark 3, 6 says, and the Pharisees went forth and straightway, in other words, and immediately took counsel with the Herodian, the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Now, understand the Herodians and, and the Pharisees, they were always in conflict. They didn't agree with each other. So two people that was never really agreeing with each other set aside their difference to come together to find out how they might destroy the Lord Jesus because they were envious of him and we'll see now can we see how the prophecy of isaiah came to fruition in that era how the religious leaders called good evil they tried to equate jesus healing a man on the sabbath as evil by saying he was working on the sabbath the hatred also came to the apostles in this segment of scriptures the lord jesus wants wanted the apostles to understand that they should rejoice and be exceedingly glad when they are criticized, insulted, and mistreated for his name's sake. The Lord knew that the apostles needed to comprehend this because he knew the hatred, the persecution, which is to mistreat, to hunt down aggressively, to apprehend a person forcibly that the apostles would face because of their relationship with the Lord Jesus. Because they remained in the Lord Jesus and were producing fruits. 
right? It, it, this is bound to happen. He knew it. And so once he ascended back to heaven, he knew what they were going to face. Some of the apostles were thrown into in prison and beat for the name of Jesus. They were beat for the name of Jesus. Scriptures tells us in Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 42, and I'm paraphrasing it, but you can write it down or you can turn there and see it's very close. Acts chapter 5, verses 40 and 42. When the high priest and the council had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. Look at that. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. So the apostles departed from the presence of the council and look, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for, the, for Jesus' name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease. In other words, they did not stop from teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They understood how blessed they really were and they count and they continued in the faith. Once again, they understood how blessed they really were from the actions that took place and continued in the faith because they remember what Jesus told them, rejoice and be exceedingly glad when this stuff happens. Many of the apostles were martyred, yes, killed for their association with him and sharing the good news of his death, burial, and resurrection with many. They were verbally and physically assaulted for this. They were spoken evil of by the religious leaders, the high priests, the councils. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, out of the New King James Version, that's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, out of the New King James Version. And it reads, but rejoice, to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. So the one that's, that is reproaching you on their part, they're blaspheming God. But look at, but on your part, God is being glorified when this is happening. So saints, many times we say, Lord, I want you to have all the glory from my life. Well, this is part of that. When we tell the Lord, Lord, I want you to have all the glory. We don't know how that glory is going to look, how he's going to get it. But he said, when this is happening on your part, because it's happening to you, God is being glorified through that, from your life. Hallelujah to God. In our time today, what the Lord Jesus wants us to know is the next time someone is coming against you and insulting you and saying evil things against you because of your relationship with the Lord Jesus, because you are denying ungodliness, you are walking in integrity and standing on the word of God. Because you are living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Just remember, because you are sharing your testimony of who Jesus is and how he turned your life completely around and how he's been so good to you. As you keep sharing the word of God and producing good works, because you want to be pleasing to the Lord Jesus, people are going to hate you. They're going to criticize and they're going to insult you. Remember, why did Cain kill Abel? Because Cain's works were evil, right? Light and darkness, they're going to conflict. But don't say, why me? Why are they coming against me for the Lord's, for the, for the name of the Lord's sake? It's because the Lord says, you are blessed. We should rejoice and be exceedingly glad because our reward is great in heaven. We have to remember this, and this is important. That's why I wanted to expend so much time on this. We have to remember this so that we don't become discouraged along this narrow path when this stuff arises to us. This is a reminder of just how blessed we truly are, and this will help us to be able to persevere through so that we may be able to love our enemies when it starts to happen. Remember, Jesus said if they hate it, 
if they hate you, just know that they hated him first. Hallelujah. And now the next section. Go ahead and title this part. Do good to them even when being mistreated. Yeah. Do good to them <laughs> even when being mistreated. Now let's go to back to our main text. We're still in Luke chapter 6, verse 27. And it was read earlier today. Now we're about to unpack it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Luke chapter 6, verse 27, out of the King Amen. James. And it Amen. reads, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. We're going to stop right there. We're about to unpack that. But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies. Do That's good it. to them which hate you. That's right. Now that word, that word love, hallelujah. That word love in the Greek, we've heard of agape, but this one, if I'm saying it correctly, is agapeo, right? It's the main root verb. It's the verb of love. Now agape is love as a noun, when it's used as a noun, which is a person, place, or thing. But in this, this is an action of love. Of The result is an action. And so the definition is to love, but the usage for it is to wish well or to take pleasure in. Now, notice, in the New Testament, usually agape sure shows the active love of God for his son and his people. But also the active love his people are to have for God, each other, and even our enemies. So in this context, this is the love we should have not only towards our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, but even towards our enemies. So here's some quick points before we get before we implement this into the scriptures. This love should cause us to feel and or display generous concern for our enemies. This love means actively doing what God prefers, not what I prefer, because if I'm in the flesh and somebody hates on me, it's not going to be good. So I got to do what God prefers. This is why we got to surrender to the spirit, because that's the only way we're going to be able to do what God prefers with him by his power and his direction. We was already on the wrong course until he put us on the right course. So if we don't do it, his, if we do it any other way, but his way is going to be chaos. This agape love is always defined by God. God will show us how to, to, to provide and, and display the love towards whatever is coming towards us. And how? Because embracing God's will and choosing, we have to choose his choices, and obeying them through his power. So the examples of agape of love is Christ living his life through the believer, right? Through you and I. If we've received the Holy Ghost, been born again of the water and of the spirit, right? This Christ dwelling inside the Holy Ghost, the spirit of God dwelling inside of us. Now, right, he's living, his, he's, he's living life through us to reconcile people back to himself, so an example of how we to our exemplify this, this love is to unselfishly, unselfishly seek the best or higher good, even for our enemies. What does that consist of? Show no partiality, show no favoritism. You know, it's easy to, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but it's easy to be nice to somebody that's nice to you. But we'll, we'll get there. Now that word enemy in the Greek, this word is ekthros, and it's not talking about the adversary. It's not. Now, we do know that unclean spirits and demonic spirits, they can take hold of a person, right? Demons can get inside of a person. This is a spiritual warfare. But this enemy is what it's talking about is that word is saying an enemy is someone openly hostile at enmity, animated by deep-seated hatred. I mean, somebody that's openly hostile or that just has some hatred towards me. Hostility proceeding out of a personal hatred bent on inflicting harm. I'm pretty sure we've all seen this in our life. If somebody just coming at us, well, I don't know what they're coming at me for. Yeah. They just bent on doing harm to me. I don't even know where it came from, Lord. What's going on? This is that's what me is talking about. Mm -hmm. 
And remember how we just read the scriptures, how the Pharisees mm -hmm. and the scribes consulted with one another on how mm -hmm. they might bring accusations against Jesus to destroy him. Right. They were looking to destroy him. So they were looking to inflict some harm on him. They were looking with some personal hatred towards him. It was deep seated. They were openly hostile towards him. In the scriptures, you will read at times they try to stone him. They just wanted to find a time where they can get to him without the people starting a riot. Now, look at how the scriptures put it this way. Now, let's implement those. Uh, the understanding of the words and let's put it in the scripture now but I say unto you which hear love that is actively feel and or display concern for your enemies someone openly hostile towards you by the power of God and direction of God do good to them which hate you do good to them which seek to inflict harm on you what am I saying what the word is saying, God wants us to feel in or display concern for and do good to them that pursue us with hatred for his namesake. You mean to tell me God wants us to feel and display concern for and do good to them that are openly hostile towards me? Lord, yeah. Oh yeah I'm going to need some help. I'm just being honest. If, if I had to do this on my own without the Holy Ghost, I, I wouldn't even get a step further, but thank yeah. you, Jesus, for your power, for helping yes. me. And I'm pretty sure there's some on here that can feel the same. If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, if All it right. wasn't for the word of God, if it yeah. wasn't for us to surrender to him, we would be in a mess of, oh, it would be chaotic. Mm. Hold on, hold on. You're telling me that God wants us to unselfishly seek the best or higher good for those who want to inflict harm on us? Yep, that's what the word is saying. So how do we know this? Well, let's look at the latter end of the scriptures in Luke chapter six, drop down to verse 31. But out of this, I'm gonna read the Amplified just for the clarity and for time's sake. And so that's Luke chapter six. We're still in the same context. Just going to change up the version to the Amplify. In verse 31, it says, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. So no matter what they're doing to me, God is telling me I need to treat them how I would want them to treat me, even if they're treating me another way that I don't like. That's the only way they may see it. He's, he, he wants us to treat others the same way that you want them to treat you. That's and right. that will help us to in our walk so that if we mm -hmm. ever find ourselves about to say something and that's the spirit convicting saying, hey, slow up. Remember, treat them how you want them to treat you because a man, what a man souls he reaps. <clears throat> so look at verse 32. If you only love those who love you, what credit or what reward is that to you? For even sinners... Love those who love them. What is that saying? Even sinners, even when we didn't have the word of God, didn't have the spirit of God, we knew how to love somebody who loved us. It, it was simple. You love me. Oh, okay. I love you. Right. It, it wasn't, it wasn't a conflict. You know, he's, he's saying, but this is the holy calling. We're called to do more. We're called to do more. At verse 33, if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit or what reward is that to you? For even sinners do the same. It, he's just repeating it and showing like, if we just do what somebody does to us, uh, you know, if he, he's good to me. I'm going to be good to him. He's saying this, the sinners didn't even need the word of God or the spirit of God to, to do good to somebody that did good to them. But because we have the spirit of God and the word of God, he said, even when they treat you bad, do good to them. Even when they come in and, and all this stuff is coming against you, they criticizing you, reviling you, reproaching you. They trying to get you. They trying to trip you up, trying to move you out, trying to get you fired from your job, whatever it is. Still do good to them. Even when they not. Do good. You. That's right. Do good. If you lend money. To those from whom you expect to receive it back. What credit is that to you? What reward is that to you? Even the sinners lend to sinners expecting to receive back the same amount. What God is showing us is we got to do the opposite. 
He's calling us to a higher calling. His standards are way beyond our standards. And this helps us to see even what's going on because members, a person without the word of God, it's easy for them. Okay, I loaned you some money. I'm, okay, I'm looking for it back. But how about somebody coming against you? How about somebody you know that don't like you anyway, but now they in a rut. They stuck and they really need some help. He said, I still want you to lend to them. Don't even expect nothing back. I know you know what they're talking about you, but still, if yeah. you allow them to see the love that I can give through you, they may be drawn on to repentance. Hallelujah to God. Yeah. Yeah. They may just draw, you might just, he may use you as a vessel to draw them in, even when they know that they was against you. They know that they yeah. are yeah. hostile towards you. But hey, he's still saying, because you got the spirit. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because you have the spirit. Because you have the word, I want you to do good to them anyways. This is another step in our spiritual growth. That's this right. is that because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy calling. This is that sanctified, set apart for his purpose. This is what that calling is all about. This is that follow peace with all men in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This is that. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. This is that. The Lord is calling for us to do exact opposite of what the world would do. How they would respond. Now let's look at how the Lord Jesus treated his enemies. And this is going to get personal. Just think about how the Lord Jesus treated you. Because at one point in our lives, we were all an enemy to God. Someone may ask, how so? How, how could I have been an enemy? Well, let's, let's look. Turn with me, James chapter four, verse four. That's James chapter four, verse four. And I'm gonna read this out of the Amplified version. Once again, James chapter four, verse four. And it reads, you adulteresses, disloyal sinners, flirting with the world and breaking your vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend, that is loving the things of the world, is being God's enemy. So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So saints, what we have to realize is at one point in our lives, before we were saved, we were friends of the world. Because we loved and participated in the things of the world. At one point for sure. At one point in our lives. Didn't we walk in darkness? Weren't we living in sin and blind to it? My Bible says for all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. So at one point in our lives. Didn't we live in opposition to the word and will of God. Whether we knew it or not. Because of the things we participated in and did, this is how repentance comes about because we have to first recognize that, oh, he's right and I'm wrong. Now I need to change for him. Thank you, Lord. At one point in our lives, didn't we operate out of the flesh and produce dead works of the flesh? And I'm talking to myself as well, not just to you all. I know. See, God has allowed me to recognize many things I used to do. Thank you, Lord. I used to be a fornicator, a drunkard, drunk off all different types of stuff. Seven days a week, couldn't even remember what I did half the time. And I had to just wake up and ask somebody, what did I do? What kind of life was I living? I had to apologize for stuff I couldn't remember I did because I was fully intoxicated, out of my mind. I was lying, cheating, greedy for money. I'm just being transparent with you. I was involved. I was in love with the things of the world. I made myself an enemy of God. But at some point in our lives, weren't we lying, idolizing people or even material things, whether it was a car, a house, whether it was, you know, wh whatever it could be, some type of items, you know, fabric, clothing. You know, weren't we fighting, envious, even hating folks, smoking, cursing, right, C cursing folks out, gossiping, causing division, greedy for money and such things like that. That's just the name of few. At some point, we were unsaved, and even possibly after we were saved as a new saint, 
if we're being honest. Some of us may have slid back into sin thinking, and I'll be the first to admit, I used to think, oh, I'm walking with God. I can still do the same thing. No, repentance got to come about. He said, walk in the newness of life. But at some point, we may have found ourselves backbiting. It may have hidden resentment or hatred or even unforgiveness in our hearts, even toward another saint. At one point, I'm just saying. And because that was a child of God, we were doing that to God himself when we start to understand. But saints, the religious leaders rejected God by hating, persecuting, and rejecting the Lord Jesus. But God, somebody say, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You mean to tell me through all that stuff I was doing to you, Lord, you still going to allow me to have everlasting life? What? Wait a minute. All that stuff? You're going to throw my sins in the depths of the sea? What kind of love is this? Saints, God so loved the world, right? He, yeah. gave, he gave us Jesus. Uh -huh. God so loved mankind because he made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that right. in him we would become the righteousness of God. That is, we would be made acceptable to him and placed in a right relationship with him. By his gracious, loving kindness. I'm going to say that again. God still loved mankind because he made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that in him, we would become the righteousness of God. That is, we would be made acceptable to him and placed in the right relationship with him by his gracious loving kindness god allowed himself to become human to be crucified yes the lamb that was slain so that we could have a way to be forgiven for all of our mess all of our sins he laid down his life at the cross for those who were openly hostile towards him and inflicted harm on him and everyone else that we might have a chance to be saved Thank you, Lord. Just think about it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Even when I was in my sins, I was an enemy to God, but he still loved me. He loved you. And he drew us out of darkness. Wow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let, let me ask you this. Didn't God do good to us when we were an enemy Amen. to him? Whether we made Amen. ourselves me and weren't even sure of it. We just read the mm -hmm. scriptures. Anything you love the things of the world. Scriptures tell us love not the world, neither the things that are of the world, right? But didn't God do good to us even when we were an enemy to him? When we were enjoying the things of the world and only concerned about pleasing us, seeking our own desires and, and our own selfish will, didn't he still feed us? The scriptures were read today from Proverbs. He says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him, right? If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, right? Paraphrasing. But didn't he still feed us in our sins, right? When we was lost and even when we were in our sins and disobedient to his word, didn't he not provide for us and give us a place to live and a means to make money to survive when we showed total disrespect to him, to his word, whether we knew it or not? Just because I don't know the word doesn't mean that I'm not being disrespectful to the word. That doesn't negate the fact. That doesn't give me some type of exclusion. No, because God given us all a lifespan to take on his word, to learn of him, and to start to walk and live for him. Didn't he show patience and kindness towards us? Did he not give us a sound mind? Didn't he draw us out of darkness into his marvelous light? with cords and bonds of love? Didn't he love us when we seemed unlovable to everyone else, including ourselves? Was he good to us? Scripture say in Romans 2 verse 4, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? That was Romans 2 verse 4, New King James Version. 
The Lord Jesus is the prime example to follow of how we should love. He prefers for his saints to feel and actively display concern for our enemies like he did towards us because we were once an enemy of God. Now look at Luke 6.35 and that same context of the Amplified Version. That's Luke 6.35 Amplified Version. And it reads, but love, that is unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies and do good and lend expect, expecting nothing in return for your reward will be great. Look at it saying reward will be great. This is the second time we've seen that rich, abundant, and you will be sons of the most high. And the King James it says sons of the highest, right? Because he himself is kind and gracious and good to the ungrateful and the wicked. I'm going to read that again because he, talking about the Lord Jesus, God himself is kind and gracious and good to the ungrateful and the wicked. He was good to us when we wasn't good to him. King James of Matthews 545, it reads it as it was read earlier, that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. It's no partiality. On the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. That's what God wants us to do. To be kind and gracious and good. To the ungrateful and the wicked. To those that hate us. But the only way we can love our enemies the way that God prefers. And to do good to them. The only way is by the power of the Holy Ghost. By his power and his direction. We need his word. And everything has to work together to guide us. Somebody say, I can't do this on my own. I can't. The Lord Jesus knows. The apostle Paul understood this. Remember Saul. Before he became the apostle Paul was an enemy to the church. You can read that. You can go reference this in Acts chapter 9. Read the whole chapter. Saul, Saul had saints locked up and even vouched for the death of Deacon Stephen. When the Lord Jesus stopped Saul on the Damascus road, didn't God use his servant Ananias to help Saul, even though Ananias was apprehensive to helping Saul because Ananias knew that Saul was an enemy to the saints at that time. But Ananias still obeyed God and what God preferred over what Ananias felt. That's agape love, right? Agapo, agape love. Doing what God prefers over how we actually feel or how we want to respond. God used Ananias to lay hands on Saul so that he can regain his sight. And God filled Saul with the Holy Ghost. And then he was baptized and converted to Apostle Paul. So this man that was an enemy to the church. That was hunting them down. That was persecuting them. He was doing all for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus. This is why Saul was inflicting harm to them. He got stopped and, and the blinders came off. And then God converted his life. It, he, it, this is what he's showing us. That if we just love our enemies, if we do good to them, that like it was to Saul, like it was for us, he had transformed somebody else by using you as a vessel. God expects to use us to help our enemies that they may come to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus by how we respond to the hatred they display towards us because of our love and obedience to God. God expects to use us as a vessel so that person that is in opposition to his will, to his word, can be saved and converted just like we all were. If everyone's saved, and if not, we'll get to the altar call. But look at the obedient Paul. Now, here's the newness, and Evangelist Prince mentioned this earlier, right? There's going to be a prayer of repentance at the end because repentance is all about a change of heart, change of mindset, right? So Paul, now being converted, he couldn't just keep persecuting the church. Now his, the blinders was off, he's seen. So Paul, walking in the newness of life, he also reiterate this, which was read earlier from the, from, uh, the Proverbs that King Solomon wrote. In Romans chapter 12, verses 20 and 21, New King James Version, it says, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. This is doing the opposite, right? Because if I was in the flesh, 
somebody's being uh, mean to me, I ain't giving them nothing. I'm about to do what they did to me. That would be my carnal thinking. <laughs> I'm just being honest. But in the spirit, <laughs> the Lord's telling me, and, and uh, that's why we need to be surrendered and, and submissive to the spirit. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, for so in so doing, you will reap coals of fire on his head. You will reap coals of fire on his head. This is one example, another example of how we should love how God prefers and can do good to them that have hatred towards us. And then look at verse 21. The Apostle Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, in the world, they want to overcome evil by the way. I'm going to retaliate. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going I'm to make this right. You can't make nothing right. If we handle it on our own, somebody going to be dead or in jail or lock, locked up somewhere. If we do it on our own, if we just try to handle stuff on our own, <laughs> we're going to mess it all up. But if we do it the way the Lord is saying, then... It'll all work out. He tell us to just, just be still and know that he's God. Let him handle it. Let him handle all that stuff. He'll tell us when to move, what we need to do. Just, just take a minute and, Lord, let me pray to you. I need uh, this, this didn't happen. Lord, before I say anything, let me bring this to you. This is how I'm feeling. We can let the Lord know how we're feeling, what's going on. And he sends peace to us. He can, he comforts us. He helps us to diffuse situations that we may follow peace with all men, that we may work to be and, and strive at being peaceful with everyone. Was not God good to us even when we were evil to him? The message of these verses is teaching us to return good when being treated wrong and the hope that your enemy that, that person who was openly hostile toward you, that person who wished to inflict harm on you, will be ashamed of their behavior and will be moved to repentance that can only be granted by God. Once again, agape yo, God's love, God's preference and direction, how to handle the situation. Did we not come to repentance because of God? Didn't our conduct change because of the spirit and the word of God got into our heart? Our inner being, our self core, right? The inner core of a man. That's the that's the heart, the cardia. But I say unto you, which here, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. And now we're going to come to the final point. You can go ahead and write this down. Stand in the gap, right? This is back to we're going. We're still in Luke chapter six, but now we're just going back up to verse twenty eight. And you can turn it back to the King James Version if you're following by versions. This is back to the King James Version, final verse of the key verse, Luke 6, 28. And the final point is stand in the gap. And the scripture reads, bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. So what do we see? Remember earlier, we we looked at that word bless or bless it and it and it was right to to be favored, right to be happy, fortunate, well off. Well, this bless in the Greek, what it means is to speak well of in this context. So see how the same word is used, but it the the definition of it is different in the usage. And this is how when we do the studying. And so the uses for this is I speak well of or invoke a blessing on. And so, and that's for this particular context. In another context, it may mean something totally different, but in this context, is to I speak well of or invoke a blessing on for this particular passage, that word curse. We may see it and say, oh, they're they cursing us out. Now we can apply that to our day because our time, right? I'm not sure how, they're, how foul their language was back then, but this is not even dealing with cursing somebody out, like cussing folks out, right? This is curse is to imprecate evil on. In other words, to wish evil on. Now, doesn't this sound familiar with, as the passages before, what was happening to Jesus, what happened to the apostles, right? Curse is to wish evil on. And despitefully, how this, the definition of this in the Greek is to revile. We've heard that word earlier and throughout the, throughout this. So, we see how the Lord is just reiterating over and over, right? And the usage of this revival is to insult, to treat wrongfully, wrongfully, to slander, 
to falsely accuse, to treat abusively. So now that we have those meanings, let's plug them in the scriptures to help broaden our understanding, to see what God was saying then so we can apply it to our time today. So let's read the scriptures this way with the inputs, uh, with the meanings uh, input in the scripture. In verse 28 says, bless, invoke a blessing, wishing God's blessing and peace on them that curse, wish evil on you and pray. Stand in a gap, intercede on their behalf of them which despitefully use you. Let's look at it this way. Bless, speak well of them that wish evil on you. Mm, wait a minute. Bless, speak well of them that wish evil on you. And pray, stand in the gap, intercede on behalf for them which treat you wrongfully. You want me to pray for them, Lord, when, when they doing all this? You want me to stand in the gap for them? But bless, greet them that curse you. Lord, you want me to greet them? You want me to still be able to speak well to them? Yeah, what? And pray and stand in the gap and intercede on behalf of them which slander you? And they saying all this, they doing all this? You want me to still do good and you, you want me to pray for them now? And let's look at how the Lord Jesus invoked the blessing and stood in the gap for them that wished evil on him. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Once again, that's the gospel of Luke still, but chapter 23. And we're out of the King James and we're going to read 1 through 2, 13 through 21 and 33 and 34. And I'll call out the, uh, the numbers that we're on. And that's Luke chapter 23, King James Version, starting off on verse 1. And it reads, and the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. Now, this is before Jesus was crucified. This is what took place. And the whole multitude arose of them arose and led him to unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, there's that word. They began to accuse him. They've been accusing Jesus of a lot of stuff. We found this fellow perverting the nation and for beginning and for and for and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar saying that he himself is Christ as a king. Here's another accusation. They accused him of healing on the Sabbath. They were trying to trip him up about other things, conversations about divorce. Now they're trying to say that he was telling people to don't pay taxes to Caesar because he's uh, he is Christ the king. They, they just twisting things all up. And now go to verse 13. And this is all in your Bible. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, and the rulers and the people. Now, Pilate, he's the governor, right? He, he was able to make the decision on what was to happen. And in verse 14, said unto them, ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof you, ye accuse him. So Pilate said, you know, all these accusations, you're saying, and they were, there were more accusations there if you go read all the 23 through 24, right? But he's saying even right here, all these accusations you just said, I don't find them in him. I don't know how you're finding them, but I don't find them. And verse 15 says, nor, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him and lo, and look, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Like I sent him also to Herod, right? And he didn't find nothing worthy of death. What you're, what you're accusing this man of, the Lord Jesus, what you're accusing him of. Verse 16, I will therefore chastise him and release him. I will therefore, you know, reprimand him, beat him, right? <clears throat> and verse 17, for of necessity, he must release one of them at the feast, right? So there was, there was always one person that could get released at, at the feast, right? And so in verse 18, and they cried out all at once. Who cried out? Religious leaders, Pharisees. They all cried out and, and everyone else that was trying to bring these charges against Jesus saying, away with this man. Away with who? Away with the Lord Jesus and release unto us Barabbas, right? They're saying, release unto us this criminal. Jesus didn't know no sin. He didn't do no sin, but release unto us that criminal. Let's see what that criminal did. Right. Because Jesus was no criminal. He didn't know. He knew no sin. No sin was ever found in him. He was innocent. 
didn't do nothing. Just, just understand, a lot of times we ain't going to do nothing and folks just ready to do stuff to us. And look at Barabbas, verse 19, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. So he incited insurrection, rebellion, right? Was a murderer and cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, who? The Pharisees and everybody else that was against the Lord cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. Here's that. They wish evil on him. They wish evil on the Lord. They bring all these false accusations up until this point. Now, drop down to verse 33. Here is how the Lord Jesus stood in the gap and invoked a blessing. Right? Going through all this. Going through all this. And, and there's so much more that took place on how he was crucified. And when you go and read and all the things that happened to him, he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. But in this verse 33, look at what how Jesus stands in the gap. And this wasn't even just for them. It was for all of mankind. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, they crucified him in the malefactors, right? Those are the, the actual criminals. One on the right hand and, and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Notice how they wished evil on Jesus by crucifying him on the cross. And yet Jesus stood in the gap between heaven, earth, and hell. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Gospel of Mark in chapter 15, verse 10 out of the Amplified, it lets us know that they handed over Jesus it says this, for he was aware that the chief priest had turned Jesus over to him because of envy and resentment. So how do we apply this to our time today, saints? Now, in our time today, because you represent the Lord Jesus, there will be people who wish to falsely accuse you, whether on your job, whether at school, or maybe even amongst family, friends, and sad to say, but even some saints may even try to inflict harm on you. I'm just being transparent. Because we follow and serve the Lord Jesus, you will face some people who wish to slander your name, crucify your reputation, and try to get you to act out of control to destroy your character. Saints of God, the Lord Jesus is saying, when this takes place, still speak well of them and greet them when you see them. Hold on, hold on. Let me make sure I'm understanding correctly, Lord. You are really expecting me to bless and show kindness to those who curse me, to those who are doing all this stuff to me? Yes, the Lord, the Lord God wants you to know to pray for them which insult you. Stand in a gap to intercede for them who treat you wrongfully. Pray for them which mistreat you. Pray for them which abusively use you. Stand in a gap to intercede for them which falsely accuse you. Pray for them which slander you. Stand in a gap and intercede for them when they speak maliciously against you. Pray for them which harass and persecute you for the name of the Lord's sake. Saints, let us be led by the Holy Ghost to stand in the gap, to pray that God will forgive and have mercy on them. Once again, let us pray that God will, will forgive and have mercy on them, which curse and despitefully use us. And let us pray that the Lord may give us strength and help us to endure the hatred as it comes for his name's sake. Saints, let us be led by the Holy Ghost to stand in the gap and to pray that God will help us to forgive them. We also need help to forgive as it's happening to us, or then we can become just like that. So let us pray while we're praying for them. Pray for yourself, Lord, I need some help too. Have, help me to forgive and have mercy on them which wish evil on me and wrongfully treat me and falsely accuse me. Help me, Lord, to pray that you may forgive us, that you may give us the strength and help us to endure the hatred as it comes. This is that never return evil for evil or insult for insult. 
Avoid scolding, berating, and any kind of abuse. But on the contrary, give a blessing. Pray for your enemy's well-being contentment and protection for you have been called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing from God that brings well-being happiness and protection speak well of them this is that speak well of them even when you know they speak in evil of you this is that thank God for your enemies because they are helping you grow more and mature in the Lord this walk is not easy, but hallelujah, we can get through it and we're going to make it by the power of the Holy Ghost and his word. This is that pray for them, pray for their well-being, pray that they may experience the peace and love of God. This is that ask God to bless them, ask God to deliver them, ask God to heal them, invoke a blessing, petition God. I need your help, Lord. Ask them, ask the Lord Jesus. I need your help that he may relieve them from the hatred and that he may help you to endure as it person and persevere through all the hatred and the mistreatment as it come this is that be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful saints this is how god prefers for us to love our enemies and how we should stand in the gap for them that hate us for his name's sake Lord, help us stand in the gap. I'm saying, Lord, help us stand in the gap because you stood in the gap between heaven, earth, and hell for us and forgave us when we were enemies of you. Hallelujah. And now this is the altar call. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This is the altar call. This is the altar call. If this message has pricked your heart, if there's somebody out there right now who's been following the Lord, but you have not been born again of the water and of the spirit. And what does that mean? Well, of the water is baptized in the name of Jesus and of the spirit is filled with the Holy Ghost. How do we know this? Because Acts 2.38 says, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you. He didn't say some, he said every one of you. And that wasn't just to them, that's to every other man that's alive past that time. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's to everyone, men, women, children. When we can come to understand who God is, he telling us we have to be born again, right? Even scriptures. I've heard some people say, well, it don't take all that. You don't need to be baptized you don't need to be baptized. What well, my Bible tells me in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, it says, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It says, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We can't get this wrong, saints. Hallelujah. There may be somebody out there that says, well, I, I said the sinner's prayer, and I, I, I know it sounds good. I know that sounds good. But the Lord Jesus even said in St. John chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. You heard me say it earlier, but I got it from the Lord Jesus too. That's the one who said it first. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I'm the, hey, take his word. You get what I'm saying? He cannot enter into the kingdom of God except he be born of water and of the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not. Remember that word, marvel? Don't be surprised that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Don't be surprised. Don't be fooled. You must be born again. If there's anybody out there right now that have not been born again, maybe you've been baptized, but you were baptized in, a, in Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Get re-baptized now that you understand it. It's the name of Jesus that remits sin. It's the name and blood of Jesus that is applied to you. But you got to have the name applied to you that the blood will be applied to you. Hallelujah to God. He's the one that forgives sins. He's the one that takes our sins away and throws them into the depths of the sea. Hallelujah to God. And for this. Some people may have been baptized. If you're on here and you've been baptized, but you have not been filled with the Holy Ghost, right? And how do we know that we have the Holy Ghost? Scripture tells us that it says they will speak in other tongues. That's the sign. They will speak in other tongues, right? 
you would have to have spoken in other tongues to know that you truly received the spirit. And only God can do it. Only God can give you his spirit. I can't give it to you. Your bandage prince can't give it to you. Your mama can't give it to you. Your grandparents can't give it to you. You can't shake a pastor's hand and somehow you got the Holy Spirit. I know we hear why I felt a certain way. Well, the Holy Spirit can convict folks and they don't got to have the spirit to be convicted by the spirit. So to know that you have the Holy Ghost, you will have spoken in other tongues. Hallelujah to God. And we have ministers. We have evangelists, prince, myself on standby. If there's anyone who has not been born again of the water and of the spirit. And because the only way you're going to be able to love the way God wants you to love and be submissive to his word and obedient. So you got to be born again. You got to have a change of heart, change of mindset, right? And then you got to walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? If there's anyone on here that has not been born again, go ahead and come off mute. And then also, we'll give it a few seconds. If there's anyone that has not, whether you're on the phone and and if, and if you're a little nervous or whatever the case is, right? I know later on Evangelist Prince will... Uh, We'll go and explain a little things further, but if uh, you need some personal um, prayer, right, if we're now going to open up for prayer and if there is anyone on the line that ha needs a prayer, right, we heard this. It ain't it's not easy to love our enemies. It's, it's hard enough to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, right, because we've got to be fully walking in the walking in the spirit we have to walk in the spirit so if there's anyone that needs some prayer you can go ahead and come off mute and if you have a personal prayer uh you can actually contact evangelist prince later on if it's more personal but for right now anyone that may need a uh, prayer or um have not been born again come off mute and uh we myself evangelist prince we are here to work um and, and serve for the lord